Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Take the Leap, forming a 501c3 and establishing a disease registry to advance your community. Closed captioning is available for today's webinar. To view the captions, click on the closed caption button in your Zoom toolbar and select show. My name is Katie Kowalski, and I work in the Education Department at NORD, and it is my pleasure to be your host for today's webinar. We're really glad you could be with us today. I'd like to say a few words about NORD. For over 30 years, NORD has led the fight to improve the lives of those with rare diseases. We do this through education, research, advocacy, and patient services. To learn more about NORD or to access our resources and events, please visit us at rarediseases.org. And you can also follow NORD on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. This webinar is being recorded and we're gonna make it available to everyone who registered in a few weeks. Please feel free to share the recording with anybody who wasn't able to join us today. We're gonna be answering questions at the end of the presentation. So if you're watching right now using the Zoom browser, you'll see a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen in the meeting control bar. Just click the Q&A button, that'll open the box and you can type in your question. This webinar is being brought to you as part of NORD's Rare Launch program. Rare Launch provides training and support for start, starting not-for-profit organizations and it helps nonprofits develop good governance and sustainable practices. Rare Launch also empowers nonprofits to effectively support research. In December, Rare Launch is gonna hold two important workshops. On December 2nd, NORD will provide a cost-free workshop on forming a foundation. The topics will include how to find a disease community when your population is small, how to incorporate a nonprofit, how to raise funds, establish a board of directors, and recruit volunteers. On December 3rd, NORD will hold a second cost-free workshop on becoming research ready. The topics will include the drug development process and how natural history data supports research. Participants are also gonna learn about the support available for establishing a disease registry and how to make connections with researchers and epidemiologists. And finally, the workshop's gonna provide guidance on how to write and manage research grants. These are exceptional learning opportunities. So to register, please go to our website, rarediseases.org. You can find the Rare Launch page and click on Rare Launch Workshops. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Pamela Gavin is the Chief Strategy Officer for the National Organization for Rare Disorders. Pamela sets the strategic direction for NORD. She's responsible for bringing together all of the stakeholders in the rare disease space and closely works with NORD's board of directors, partners, corporate council members, and member organizations. Colleen Brunetti is a pulmonary hypertension patient living in Connecticut. She's a rare disease advocate and co-founder of Generation Hope, which is an online support group for young adults. This year, Colleen took over as the Pulmonary Hypertension Association's Chair of the Board of Trustees. She's the author of four books and numerous articles on thriving with rare and critical illnesses. Jessica Bahanowicz is the Associate Director of Research Programs at the Foundation for Prater Willey Research. In that capacity, she supports the management of the Foundation's grant portfolio, the Global PWS Registry, and other research initiatives. In addition to her work for the prater willey Foundation, Jessica is the aunt to a 15-year-old with prater willey Syndrome. So we're really thrilled to have all of you with us today. And with that, I'd like to ask Pamela to get us started. Thank you, Katie. Hi, everyone. It's great to be with you today. And I'm really excited to be talking about um, the rare launch program and the workshops we have planned for this December. Alone we are rare, together we are strong is a phrase that really speaks to Nord's perspective and is interwoven in much of the work that we do. As an introduction to the important topics we'll be covering in our December workshops, I'd like to ground today's discussion in some historical perspective. From that, we not only learn from the past, but we leverage it to inform a brighter future. 
community engagement and capacity building. Why are these so important topics to NORD? I'd like to share with you why we feel that to be the case. It's really in our DNA and it's reflective of how NORD came to be. Really, um, NORD got started through a grassroots advocacy campaign to bring together people, families, patients, other um, advocates in the community to advocate for a brighter future, for a more promising future, for stronger, deeper focus on therapy, discovery, and innovation in the United States. And through that community engagement, they actually came together over a, a long multi-year effort to advocate for this change, predominantly for policy change. What resulted in, excuse me rather, is the passage of the Orphan Drug Act in 1983. But it really was the coming together of all the various stakeholders, if you will, a term that we use currently quite often in the community. But a variety of different stakeholders coming together to pass a law that was hoping um, to provide the promise that these patients and families were looking for. So with that community engagement and with the anticipation of the Orphan Drug Act passing, which actually happened in January of 1983, that summer before, a core group of these advocates that were part of this coalition came together the summer before, when it looked like they were making a progress and the momentum was really increasing and there was a good chance that the act was gonna pass. And they came together over what is really from my perspective, the first capacity building, uh, multi-disease stakeholder um, engagement uh, it, over a barbecue um, in Southern Connecticut in 1982. And you'll see from the slide, the environment was very different back then, but that's what really it meant to capacity build. If you notice the flip charts that people had, um, they were uh, some of the names of the folks that were pioneers are listed on the slide here. And some of the disease states that they were uh, personally connected to, but shared a common uh, goals and vision for that brighter future. Um, brought them together. And just from pers for a perspective, I actually picked this um, picture because I thought it was really interesting to not only see, you know, obviously um, the way people dressed, et cetera, may have been reflective of the times, but take a look at those cars. Back then, people didn't get on their computers in Google terms or Bing terms. They faxed, wrote letters, made phone calls, numerous phone calls, went to the library, and really um, were challenged to find those connections and to get together in ways that really help them plan and organize and grow and evolve and to strategically consider the future. But all the hard work they did really resulted in some amazing progress. Through that grassroots coalition and that community engagement and building, they were successful in helping to precipitate the passage of the ODA. And it did provide a framework among many other things and support from different agencies within the federal government, such as the within the HHS, such as FDA and NIH, et cetera, and their offices of rare disease. It also it it it, it the big one of the biggest opportunities was that it created this financial framework that created the incentives for people, uh, researchers, both in the public and private sector to actually study rare disease and to invest in treatments and cures. And some of that success can be seen in its impact today. If we look back in those days when they were sitting around um, in those lawn chairs, back in 1983, two products had been approved that were um, for orphan indications. And look where we are today. Pretty significant, um, almost 50% of the products approved through the Office of um, Drugs um, at FDA, 44%, that's almost 50% for novel products. 
in 2019 that were orphan indication. Some of that was relative to that early community engagement. And look where we are from a capacity building perspective. Here's just one example of the different venues in which NORD and its member organizations and others in the community um, come together to support each other from a capacity building perspective. This is a far cry from that photograph um, on that barbecue in that summer day in 1982. And what this means is that we are learning as the community is evolving, the marketplace is evolving, technology, innovation, scientific innovation has really allowed us to evolve and change in the way we tackle these things. And we should take advantage of them, continue to do so. Yet there's much more work to do. And, I, and I'm speaking to the choir for those of you who are interested in establishing a nonprofit or those who are looking to um, prepare your organizations to launch research programs. You're doing this because you know there isn't there need to do more work or you're contemplating it, I should say, because there is more work to do. And there are a lot of challenges despite those successes and we want to acknowledge them, we want to build upon them. We still want to be realistic about the environment, its evolution and the challenges that exist today, whether they were challenges that existed in the past or those new challenges that come as technology and disruptive behavior provides new opportunity, it often provides new challenges. So we're ready, we're ready to move forward and, and to tackle these challenges just as we've done in the past. So those are some of the reasons why I'm excited to consider or to invite you all to rather to participate in the workshops that we're planning. Community engagement and capacity building are as important today as they were back then. We have greater opportunity to achieve more, more quickly, more effectively, and of course, more efficiently than we've done in the past. So we wanna build upon those learnings and work with you to achieve some of those goals. Why is it important to form a foundation? We will talk about this at the workshop. We will, we will get, go into great detail as Katie, um, mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, the things that we want to cover, we'll be covering in that. And the same with becoming research ready. Why is it important for where your community is and its evolution to, foot, to, to embark on uh, research programs? But, but a key point of, of both of those areas of, of focus is, is financial money. It's very challenging in these times to operate um, and exchange money, to receive money from donors, to raise money for research, to raise money for capacity building, to raise money from community engagement, if, you're, if you don't have the good governance and the proper infrastructure. So we will dig into these in greater detail in December, and I hope you all are, are able to make it and join us and register for those events. So with that backdrop, a little bit of history and a little bit of where we're going in the future, um, it, it is my pleasure to introduce Colleen Brunetti of the Pulmonary Hypertension Association. She certainly has an inspiring story, story that I'd love for you to hear about. So take it away, Colleen. Thank you, Pamela. All right, so I would like to begin with a quote from the memoir, A History of PHA, which can be found on PHA's website. It starts, as all good stories of movers and shakers do, with a question. How did a handful of very sick patients and a few highly specialized doctors start paving the path that now leads around the world? How did they set a model of patient-doctor cooperation that is being copied by other disease-related associations? What follows is an inspirational story of synergy, serendipity, altruism, self-interest, love, and determination. Those adjectives from synergy to determination encompass what makes a great organization. You're here today to learn about starting a nonprofit. Often people think about that from the business side, which can feel daunting. But what must come first is the heart and soul of it all your why for wanting to start a nonprofit 
and maybe your who, the person you love with a rare disease. You're here because you care. You're here because you think you can make a difference. So the truth is you probably already hold the keys to finding success. I'd like to walk you briefly through the 30 year history of PHA with a focus on its beginnings and an eye to its future. We start with Dorothy Olson and Teresa Knasik, two patients living in Florida, eager to find others just like them and who eventually found each other. Dorothy was tenacious to the core. For years after she was diagnosed, she wrote letters to Nord and other patients she could find trying to make connections. It wasn't until Teresa found her nine years later, again through Nord, that they discovered they lived in close proximity and that's when the synergy began. Like today, Nord served as the touch point, connecting patients and supporting rare disease initiatives. At the same time, the National Heart and Blood Institute was taking notice of PH or pulmonary hypertension and the very first PH registry was formed. And while it took five years to gather data on just 187 patients, that data did inform future research and the first treatments for PH. It also attracted the attention of young up and coming doctors many of whom would become preeminent leaders in the field of pulmonary hypertension and scientific leaders at PHA. In 1990, PHA took its first form as the United Patients Association for Pulmonary Hypertension, or UPATH. The very first newsletter called Pathlight was written. 50 copies were run at Kinko's, stapled together and mailed out to the people Dorothy and Teresa had managed to locate. Also of note, that edition of Pathlight included an article by Teresa's husband from the point of view of a caregiver, including the caregiver voice and providing support to the loved ones of patients remains critical to our mission even today. The goal of Pathlight was and remains a way to connect patients, families and medical professionals. It helped to build relationships and broke down natural barriers between key stakeholders, all volunteer written it allowed each category of our constituencies to make contributions in their own areas. As with everything we do, the patient, caregiver, and medical voice all have a seat at the table. It is what sets us apart and is, I believe, the real secret to our success. Meanwhile, in another part of the country, a lady by the name of Pat Patton was experiencing symptoms. Her sister Judy had come to visit her and was alarmed by what she saw. They eventually got Pat to the Mayo Clinic where she got her PH diagnosis. Eventually, Pat, along with her husband, Jerry, moved to Florida with sister Judy still very much a part of their support system. Judy's husband, Ed, was there too and eventually would become a key visionary for PHA as well. Judy wrote to Nord seeking more patient connections and was referred to Teresa and Dorothy. The four women met around what is now our iconic kitchen table and the real magic began. For eight years, the organization was run entirely by volunteers. Early on in their efforts, they were counseled to create a medical board, going right to the nation's leading physicians for membership. In 1992, our first conference was proposed by Judy's husband, Ed, which came to fruition in 1994. Both ideas were gutsy at the time. They hadn't been done and they were big risks. They paid off in spades and both the Scientific Leadership Council and the International Conference remain today. An interesting note about our first conference, as it was being planned, a young research physician by the name of Greg Elliott contacted the organization. He'd heard about the conference and asked if he could come there to draw blood for his research work. As the story goes, he was initially met with suspicion. Who was this guy? Well, he was vetted, he came, and his work led to the discovery of the first identified pH associated gene. I've often heard him say he accomplished more for research in that one weekend than he could have in years in his lab. He is one of my heroes. Today, we still provide a research room at conference where patients and family members can donate their blood and complete questionnaires to drive research forward. In 1996, Bonnie Ducart would become the first patient to chair the organization. She passed in 2001. She would remain the only patient to chair the organization until this June when I began my tenure. Bonnie was a visionary too. 
notably helping to bring PHA's efforts into the digital age. By all counts, she was passionate and brilliant. I've often heard her name invoked with so much respect and a tear in the speaker's eye. Although I never met her as the only patient to follow in her footsteps as chair, I am in awe of her and grateful for the example that she set. When I think about our early leaders, what stands out is how they were always reaching outwards. They never relied just on their own expertise or interests. They were always inviting in expert voices, learning from one another, and helping willing volunteers to find meaningful tasks by which they might contribute to the cause. In short, they understood the power of personal connection and they made it happen, both with bulk communication and handwritten letters and phone calls, bringing people into the fold. The organization would continue until 1999 as a purely volunteer run endeavor. Their membership and income grew a lot over the years. And in 1999, they hired their first part-time employee, a community organizer by the name of Reno Aldrighetti. Reno would eventually go full-time and then serve PHA as our first CEO and president right up until his retirement in 2016. He is truly a legacy CEO and to me, he's family. It never escapes me what he did for patients like me. So it was just before Reno's hire that the organization secured their 501c3. The short version of the story is that someone wanted to make a sizable donation but could only do so for a nonprofit. As Reno told me when I interviewed him for this talk, anyone who wants to raise money needs a 501c3. He's a straight shooter. And that's all there is to it. With this designation and under Reno's leadership, PHA went in from bringing 132,000 their first year as a formal nonprofit to 445,000 their next year and to 1.1 million in the third. Reno lived by and insisted his staff focus on the following mantra. Any person whose life is touched by PH has the right to fight back as much as health and interest allows. Like the vision set by our founders, we create opportunities for engagement and we encourage new ideas and directions. I could go on for a long time about all that PHA continued to accomplish, but my time is short and so I'd like to speed up to today. I know in my own experience, I was brought up through PHA because of this philosophy of creating opportunity and engagement. When I was diagnosed, I was a scared and slightly timid elementary special education teacher. Never in my wildest dreams did I see myself as chair of a board or at podiums in front of international audiences and government officials or presenting for Nord. But someone at PHA saw something in me. It was a staff member and she prodded me along and gave me more and more opportunities to use my voice. I discovered my gifts and my passion in PH leadership because of her and those at PHA who supported my endeavors after that. I've done a lot, but none of it would have happened if it weren't for the vision of our founders played out in later years by our dedicated staff. So look for the hidden talent in your people. We are now a strong national organization with a staff of about 25, over 80 accredited PH care cent centers of care or centers of excellence, and the founders of a new registry with over 1200 enrolled patients. I've thought a lot about what PHA means to me as a patient and who has come before me to make it all possible. The simple truth is this, you never know when you might be in the company of greatness or even what potential lies in you. Here's a picture of all the living PHA Board of Trustees chairs along with our first and now current CEO. When I look at this gathering, sure, I see some incredible doctors who paved the way medically but I also see a father of a PH patient, a mother of a PH patient, nurses, caregivers, bereaved family members, a microcosm of what makes PHA great. We stand on the shoulders of giants and we see success when we're not afraid to take risks, find others with a common sense of purpose and drive one another forward to make the world a better place for our disease. The sky is the limit. Even in these uncertain times, I can't wait to see what we do next. I hope that was helpful. And now I'd like to introduce Jessica Bahanovich. Thank you so much. Um, that was great. Uh, it's interesting to hear how things are similar 
among um, a lot of our organizations. Um, my name is Jessica Bohanowicz. I am the Associate Director of Research Programs for the Foundation for Potter uh, Willie Research. Uh, just a little bit of a brief introduction. Um, PWS is about approximately one in 15,000 births. Um, it is a completely random event. So although it is a genetic disorder, um, it is not an inherited disorder. Um, and it is not a single gene. And uh, it's, a, it's a region of DNA that involves multiple genes. And as a result of that, uh, it's a very broad spectrum neural development disorder uh, that incorporates a lot of different symptoms, including uh, hyperphagia, sleep disorders, behavioral issues, increased risk for mental illness, et cetera. Um, our foundation was similarly uh, started around a kitchen table about 17 years ago in 2003. And um, our mission is to eliminate the challenges of PWS through the advancement of research and therapeutic development. So within that mission, because our foundation is primarily focused on research and on therapeutic development, we have a variety of different programs involved uh, in, at supporting all of the various different steps of that process. Um, we have grants programs that uh, help support research and discovery. We um, have uh, some other initiatives that help support uh, preclinical animal development for, uh, for um, studies that can help support clinical trials. We're involved in various different stages, phase one through phase three of clinical trials. We hope very soon to one day be involved in the post-approval post phases of, um, of a therapeutic that has been approved for powder relay syndrome. But what I wanna talk about today is specifically the PWS registry and how it supports all of these different initiatives across the entire spectrum of the therapeutic development pathway, every, every step from research and discovery all the way through post-approval. As I continue on this topic, I do wanna reiterate, uh, and you'll see this graphic on most of these slides, that this is a journey. Participating in research, um, whether it be through a registry or through other products, um, other programs in your foundation is, is a journey. We are all at different stages on that journey. We're all at different, ste we're all at different steps. Um, and wherever your organization is, is okay. It's great. Um, and there's nowhere to go but forward for all of us. Um, we started out, like I said, approximately 17 years ago. And um, I'm going to speak with you about specifically our registry uh, moving forward. So the goals of our registry, of the PWS registry, um, this was launched in 2015. So approximately uh, just over five years ago. Um, it took us approximately a year to develop and to launch the registry. And our goals uh, are to, as I mentioned, this program is to designed to help support all of the different aspects of improving lives with those affected by PWS and their families and their caretakers. And when we're talking to families about the registry, what we're really trying to reiterate with families is, is your story represented? Nobody's journey with prader willi syndrome or any rare disease for that matter is the same. Um, there may be similarities, there may be overlaps, but every story is a little bit different. And we wanna make sure that when we're uh, presenting data to clinicians or trying to involve sponsors, that we are uh, using, I use the analogy of, of our syndrome as a quilt and every single patient is a patchwork in that quilt. And we want every single patchwork to be filled. So we are working to develop a comprehensive database of individuals with powder blade syndrome. It is all web-based. We're trying to better understand the full spectrum of PWS characteristics. Um, we're working to support and expedite the completion of clinical trials by basically serving as a matchmaking service, uh, helping sponsors find participants that meet the inclusion exclusion criteria for their specific studies. We're looking to analyze our data uh, within the registry to help identify areas of unmet need, um, areas of unmet treatment, uh, as well as understudied areas of research. We're looking to see what families are doing in the real world to help guide standards of care. And as I mentioned, this is all to help support and improve uh, the lives of those with PWS. So how has the registry helped support our involvement in, in research? Um, this has been a multi-stage process. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, a constant and continual growth. And so when we first started the registry in year one, Really, we were just marketing the registry, trying to drive enrollment, trying to drive participation, trying to increase excitement around this tool um, and to help educate the patient community as well as 
all of the other stakeholders, clinicians, sponsors, uh, government and regulatory agencies, that this project was launched and that it was going to be an incredibly valuable tool as it continued to grow. So year one involved uh, the launch of our infographics. Uh, we do these, we try to do these approximately every two months. Each one covers a different topic. Um, these are designed to be very, very high level. Um, they go out to the parent, the uh, participants that are involved in the registry. This is their data, and we want to make sure that we're reporting things back to the community. Um, but it also, as I mentioned, raised awareness that of the registry among other stakeholders in the community. What we saw as a result of that is in years two and three, um, as awareness increased, people, clinicians, and researchers started wanting to know, well, what else do you have in the registry? What other kinds of data are in there? Um, I'm seeing this thing in my clinic, in my small cohort of patients that I'm tracking, um, is that what the registry shows as a global phenomenon? So um, as I mentioned, we started to see increased interest in the registry. It started out with some smaller projects, medical students and graduate students, um, some internships at drug companies coming in and doing some uh, high level or some initial analysis. And these were mostly presented in poster sessions at various different conferences. That continued to fuel the fire of, of interest and awareness of this uh, of the registry as a research tool. Um, and the interest has just continued to grow and grow every year. Um, the number of requests coming in for data has increased. Um, and the level and complexity of the types of data that are being analyzed, as well as the questions that are being asked, um, has continued to increase. So what we're seeing uh, in years three and four is that it's not necessarily just uh, requests to analyze data that are already in the registry, but it's requests to use the registry as a tool for new projects, to use the registry as a way to develop new surveys. Um, one of the most exciting uh, aspects of this was that uh, a particular drug company called Levo, they were uh, developing a survey on the uh, incidence of anxiety and distress in probability syndrome as a secondary endpoint for their phase two clinical trial. And um, we built this survey in collaboration with Levo. It was uh, launched and optimized, validated through the registry, and it is now uh, currently actively being used as a endpoint, as a secondary endpoint in their phase two trial. Um, so that's been a really exciting collaboration. We've been able to um, gather patient experience data, which has been very uh, relevant to our community. We launched a new registry on how uh, COVID shutdowns were impacting access to care and how our community was responding to stay at home and, and being schooled at home. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, just increased levels of uh, interest from clinicians and researchers uh, trying to analyze data in their respective, um, uh, in their respective fields of expertise. In year four, we published our first peer-reviewed publication in the scientific literature. This was a huge step in being able to raise awareness among those who are not already directly involved in our foundation. So clinicians who may have patients with PWS but maybe are not aware of, of our foundation or of the registry. And it also serves as a reference for future publications for researchers that are uh, currently doing studies that need a reference of how the registry was established. In years four and five, we launched our largest uh, project, largest collaboration. Um, this, we were approached by a sponsor who wanted to do a uh, four-year natural history study uh, through the registry. So these are people that are all within the registry, um, but it's a sub-study within the registry. So they complete the registry surveys, but this sponsor also in collaboration with us developed some additional surveys specifically to look at uh, serious medical events the incidents, uh, types, severity of serious medical events, hospitalizations, things along those lines um, within the PWS population. It also involved um, a blood draw for a specific type of a lab study. And because of the size and scope of this project, um, it uh, required a new full-time hire for the registry staff who helps coordinate this specific project. Um, it's been really exciting. We're in year two right now, and we're hoping that this will help serve as a, this natural history study will help serve as a reference population for um, upcoming regulatory submissions. There's always more to do. Um, as I mentioned, uh, this whole process every year, this project continues to grow. The types of work that we're doing with the registry continues to grow. So as we look forward, you know, we kind of 
look at maybe we're on a middle step now and we are looking forward to being able to do some whole genome sequencing and to link that to our registry data um, to develop a clinical portal where clinical data could be linked to patient data, possibly links to electronic health records. Currently, it's only available in, in uh, English. And as I mentioned, um, we are hoping that there will be an approval of a new therapeutic on the horizon and that we would be able to use the registry for some post-approval studies. So hopefully you're convinced uh, of the tremendous value that a registry can serve in helping your organization get involved in research. Um, next question would be, where do you start? The first step is to create a plan. And this webinar series is a, a tremendous resource and a fantastic first step on that process. One of the next uh, webinars in this series is specifically going to be the nuts and bolts of developing a registry. So uh, definitely keep your eyes peeled for that announcement. Um, Various different patient groups, NORD, Faster Cures, et cetera, have a lot of resources available on their different websites. Uh, different foundations that have already launched registries are always a great place to ask questions. Um, and then once you've sort of start diving in and want to, uh, want to tackle uh, developing a registry, then uh, there's a short checklist on your, on your left of uh, what those different steps would be. With that, I will close and answer any questions. Okay, so thank you, Colleen and Pamela and Jessica for those really great presentations. Um, they're inspiring because you see, you know, how your organizations from humble beginnings, you know, go on to accomplish uh, so much. And I, I love the old um, photos of people who, you know, appear to be just, you know, ordinary people sitting around planning and doing extraordinary things. Um, so we've collected questions during the, uh, during the registration period and during the live webinar. So we're gonna move uh, to a Q&A session. And as a reminder to everybody listening, we'll be sending the slides and the webinar recording out to everyone who registered for the webinar. So um, let me start uh, with Colleen. Um, Colleen, we have a, a listener who would like to get your advice on how to select board of directors members? Sure, so I think the key thing for us is making sure we have um, equal representation of all of our key stakeholders. So it doesn't necessarily mean like three patients, three caregivers, but that everyone has a seat at the table. And so when we look at pulmonary hypertension, we have the patients, we have caregivers. We also have bereaved family members because PH continues to be a disease with um, challenging outcomes. We have doctors and we have nurses. And so I would suggest that people really take a look at everyone who is involved in your community um, and try to bring some subset of each of them to the table. Great, so really getting in the different perspectives. Yes. Yeah, anybody else have anything they'd like to add? Okay, great, so we'll move to a question for um, Jessica, um, which is, you know, what is the best way that you can promote your registry to researchers? So, you know, you've yet done the research and collected the data, you know, how do you, how do you share it and get other people interested in what you're gathering? Um, okay. Uh, you know, as I mentioned in the first year or two, you know, it's it's a lot of developing the infographics. Um, we did poster presentations at our conference. We hold a scientific conference and a patient conference, but we also went um, and presented posters, you know, where the clinicians are at their various different conferences. Um, so it's, it's basically about finding who are the people you want to get involved and then showing them, starting to show them the data that you have um, and that increased their interest um, was, was when they started to actually see, see data coming out. That's when they uh, really became more interested in using it as a, as a specific tool. Um, I hope that helps. Yeah, no, no, very helpful information. Um, so now let me move um, to Pam. So Pam, um, if if people are contemplating starting a not-for-profit, are there any um, kind of key questions that they might ask themselves? Sort of, should I or shouldn't I? You know, what are what are the things you consider? You know, that that that, that would you know 
think it would make it beneficial to go ahead and, and take the leap and, and start a nonprofit. So we'll certainly go into these in greater detail in the workshop, but there are a couple of key things to take into consideration. One is um, the environment that you're um, planning to engage in. Are there other organizations in the, uh, that are in the space for the same uh, disease? And how, what, you know, what are your goals for establishing this organization? How does that compare if there are organizations that exist in the community, how, how does that compare to the work that they're doing and their mission and their areas of focus? Because when you're establishing an organization, not only is that appropriate um, for the benefit of the community at large that you're trying to serve, but from a very practical perspective, you're gonna establish bylaws, they're gonna include perhaps articles of purpose, why do you exist, you know, what, what is your intention, um, and those are all um, documents and the content of by which your, your board of directors um, all the way down to potential staff all working towards achieving those goals. So it's, it's actually a really good question um, and it is something to contemplate beforehand. Great. No, that's uh, that's really good information. And, and again, for the audience, I you know I think that these workshops are going to be taking participants through sort of a lot of those steps and those considerations. Um, so so really consider signing up. It it it's virtual. It's a day. It's going to be fabulous information. Um, so now we have a couple um, sort of more general questions about starting the five hundred one c three. So one audience member asking if if our panelists could explain, you know, um, more why fundraising and a 501c3 designation are so key. Is it, is it for tax deductibility and the contributions of donors? Is, is that why it's imp important to establish a 501c3? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Um, that, that, Katie, that is actually, you know, certainly paramount, but, um, there are other um, benefits to doing that that are kind of downstream, if you will, from that paramount primary benefit. And that is um, when a 501c3 is established, um, um, documents are filed with the IRS. Not only is that beneficial, as, as we said, for donations, um, but there's a construct that comes along with it and um, uh, associated with you know, um, a governance body and um, reporting requirements. So this notion of transparency um, and legitimacy is definitely intrinsically tied with that filing as well, even though that is not necessarily the first and most primary reason, you know, when it comes to fundraising. But, but it's also, it's, it's important. Um, you don't want to have to worry about that after the fact. There also, yeah. it opens up some different types of grant opportunities that the organization itself can apply for, um, which is again, under the umbrella of money, but it's not funding from, donate, from donations, it's funding from other, other organizations. Yeah. Yeah, right. and I would just add, because it is you know, complex and you do have to jump through some hoops to, to form one, um, it does lend an air of authenticity to your organization. So when people are considering you for donations or joining up, they know that you have kind of done some of the, the preliminary work. Right, yeah. And everything to become legitimate uh, and working, working truly for the cause, yeah. Um, okay, and another one, and, and anybody please jump in um, who, who may have an answer to this, because I, I have multiple, multiple uh, listeners who ask the same question, which is, is it possible to obtain funding or support for forming a not-for-profit organization? Anybody know if there's I don't know the answer to that because um, I came on as a full-time staff long after the foundation was founded. So unfortunately, I can't help with that question. Okay. We will, um, we can add something so, about that later in the recording. Yeah, Katie, we, we, we could um, 
we could go back to some of the staff um, at NORD and probably provide some further um, information on that and make it available to folks. I know um, there are programs here and there that um, provide uh, input. Um, there are pro bono um, uh, legal folks who have um, programs that help. So in some cases, it may not be the funding to do it, but it's the services that you need that you would use the funding for. So um, we could probably help some folks out with some resources that could help them. I just don't know off the top of my head the specific names, but I, but they are out there. Sure, we can add those to the to other to the slides that we send out. Um, so here I have an audience member writing in um, asking, "What is a natural history study?" Um, and I think that's an important thing to understand. Sure. So. Yeah. Um, right. That's, I mean, uh, I'll give the brief, the brief answer to the question. So um, generally an, a natural history study is uh, developing an understanding of a disease throughout the entire course of the disease. So um, from the first symptom all the way through every symptom that is uh, experienced, um, if it is uh, terminal through that unfortunate end. Um, if it is not, then how does the syndrome progress and change over time from you know, childhood to adolescence to adulthood into an aging population? Um, it's really trying to understand the, the full entire scope of every symptom um, of the disorder through the entire life cycle of the disorder. Um, and where you will sometimes hear that phrase with regards to registries is that you will hear a uh, you know, somebody may ask, well, are you doing a natural history study or are you doing a contact registry? Um, and a contact registry would be more of uh, defining who your patient population is, where are they, um, you know, maybe uh, obtaining some genetic confirmation information, but you're really just trying to define who is your patient population and where are they um, as, an, as basically like an address book. Um, and that, uh, that would be defined as a contact registry, whereas if you're collecting, um, you know, one time point information, uh, that's not quite a natural history study, potentially, it, it, it's, it's a, it's a you, you get into gray areas there. But generally, you're hearing it either it's a contact registry or it's a natural history study. And a contact registry is a great place to start. I mean, that's where most of us started is a contact registry because you can't do a natural history study if you don't know who your patients are and where they are. So you have to start to some extent with a contact registry. Great, very helpful. Pam, did you have something you wanted to add? Okay, um, let me... Just, just to what Jessica said, I think um, one um, presumes um, a moment in time and the other one longitude, uh, longitudinality or longevity, um, right. and and obviously, as she described it, um, natural history studies are much more complex. Um, in addition to clinical information, you're often capturing um, patients' perceptions and their experiences outside of a clinical setting. Right, and and another registry question here that I have is, you know, so say you 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 have a nonprofit organization, you start a registry. Does your organization um, retain complete control of the registry? Um, so, do you have complete control of it? And then, what happens to the registry if the foundation were to cease to exist? Right. So those are great questions. And those are the types of questions that would on that last slide, sort of where I was talking about your checklist of, of creating a plan um, that falls under some of that falls under the selecting a platform stage of that checklist. Um, there are a lot of different things to take into account when you're selecting a platform, everything from cost um, uh, data ownership is definitely one of those factors, um, uh, um, whether it's uh, patient reported or clinic reported. Um, you, there's a long list of things to consider when you are selecting your platform, what the user interface looks like, um, all of those kinds of things. So uh, I, I can tell you what our registry looks like. I'm Whenever I have this discussion with people, I'm remiss to say that there is a right answer. It's a matter of defining what your goals are and then finding the platform that meets, that meets your goals. Um, and there's not necessarily a right or wrong 
platform. For us, for the Global PWS Registry, we are on the I Am Rare platform, which is Nord's registry platform. Um, and uh, although Nord hosts the registry, our foundation uh, owns the data. Um, and we have um, a, I don't, I remember all the, the exact details of the longevity plan of the data. Um, I can try to find that. It's in our, it's in our governance documents someplace. Um, Hopefully we, I mean, we would never get to that situation, but I, I know we discussed it. I just don't remember what the exact details of it are. Great, thank you. Um, so another one, and maybe Colleen, you can take this one. Does your foundation include the international community? And maybe Colleen and Jessica could both, um, you know, actually Jessica, then you could maybe speak to, you know, or, or do you have any international uh, patients included in your registry? Sure, so uh, we do a lot of, I would say, international cooperation. Um, so PHA is often asked to give advice or sort of a, a blueprint for starting uh, pulmonary hypertension associations in other countries. So we don't have um, international chapters per se, but we work collaboratively with a lot of people around the world. Um, and then many of them attend our every other year international conference, which is really exciting. Um, as far as our registry, we do not have any um, non-USA participants at this time. Great. And um, Jessica, what about your registry? Yeah. Sure. So um, because the registry is web-based, um, it is accessible globally. We currently have, I think, 30 plus different countries represented. Now, the majority of 75% of the registry is within the United States. I think the next 10 to 12% is within Canada. So that leaves a very small percentage that actually is beyond those two countries. Um, uh, the biggest hurdle with regards to that is the language um, availability currently, um, but the registry is accessible, accessible globally. With regards to our research and grants program, um, we want to fund the best science wherever it is. So our grants program funds uh, has funded, continues to fund projects internationally throughout the world, um, you know, only limited by U.S. relations on, you know, where we can't fund projects. I think we had an application come in once from Iran and we just, we, we couldn't even begin to broach that. Um, but, but beyond that, we, we do, um, we, we try to collaborate internationally as much as possible. We do have some uh, international branches that do a lot of fundraising, um, they don't necessarily have the, the scope or manpower to run a grants program. So they will often um, uh, use our, our grants program to basically find grants that we've already pre-approved. Um, and uh, then they will target which of those projects they wanna direct their money to. So that's, that's how we handle um, uh, fundraising internationally that may wanna fund research. Terrific, thank you. Um, Katie, I was going to ask something about the international question, a little different, but complementary to what Jessica and Colleen were saying. So um, because we're, de we're dealing often with people who have volunteer staff or limited staff, um, this notion of dividing and conquering is a really important aspect of some of the work that NOR does, at least from a community engagement and an advocacy perspective and support. So probably at more of an umbrella level. We engage with um, different organizations around the globe internationally. And we, um, you know, if there's an opportunity, whether it be um, issue specific or in, impacting certain conditions, certain member organizations in our, you know, membership, we will also bring forward um, and back and forth and, and, and facilitate um, interactions at the community engagement level internationally when we can. Um, we have colleagues similar to Nord in other parts of the world, uh, CORD in Canada, CORD in China, Eurotis in Europe, et cetera. And so we feel like where we're, if there's an opportunity for us to um, support um, our member organizations like PHA and, um, um, and uh, uh, Foundation for Modern Research and others, and they're not in the room, but we are, and it, there's an international opportunity or something to learn from what's happening in another part of the world or um, for folks in the US to contribute to something that could benefit somebody else, you know, the both give and take, we're definitely engaged in those discussions whenever it makes sense and we have the resources to do so. Um, 
Yeah, no, thank you for adding that. And I've had the privilege of, you know, participating in some of those collaborations. And we just had a, you know, fantastic international panel featured at the Nord Summit. And, and um, yeah, always a privilege when we're able to do that. And we all have a lot to learn from each other. Um, one more question, let me, um, while we're talking about um, international, a question from listeners, how do we find patients or how do you find patients with a disease if there are less than a thousand cases or only, you know, very few number of cases worldwide? Anybody have any input on that? I can tackle that a little bit. So um, this is where the power of social media, I think, comes in. Um, you know, there's quite a few more pH patients than that. But when I was diagnosed, um, there were easily less than a thousand young adults who were looking for support. So it took me a year to find another pH patient like me who was um, still in my young adult years with a baby and even finishing up school and everything. So um, if you build it, they will come start to create a presence online, even a simple free website through something like, like Wix um, and then a Facebook page and just places that are very clearly labeled who you are and what you're there for so that people can start to come and find you. Great, that's really helpful. Um, so we are unbelievably um, already getting short on time. The hour's gone by fast. So um, there's a question I'd like to ask each of you, um, you know, based on your experiences, what do you think are the biggest benefits of starting a 501c3? So Colleen, maybe we can start with you. Sure. So um, besides what's already been touched on with the, the taxes and the authenticity and everything, I would say the biggest benefit is, is creating a launch pad. Um, so once you have everything all established, you have nowhere to go but up with the momentum that you can build. Great. Jessica, um, I would say, um, you know, from the stamp from our standpoint of of driving research and therapeutic development, um, you know, having a foundation that can help support that, you're basically de-risking the drug development process in in every way that you possibly can. So, um, you know. Drug companies are what we've learned over time are going to come and go. The drug companies that may be interested in your disorder or in your in your space, they're going to come and go as their targets are doing well or as their targets fail in various different you know preclinical stages or in clinical trials. Um, but the foundation will stay. The foundation is a constant, and the foundation is a re repository for all of that expertise and all of that knowledge, so that it doesn't get lost and put up on a shelf somewhere. Um, and um, so, you know, from our standpoint, it, it, it's, it's the constant factor. Um, it's the constant engine pushing things forward. It's the patient voice. Um, and the foundation gains the trust of the, of the patient community, of, 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 of your community. And then that makes collaborating with sponsors easier. Um, because if it's in collaboration with the patient group, the patients will trust you and they'll trust your organization more than they're going to trust um, anybody else. Fantastic. And Pamela? Well, Colleen and Jessica gave like some of the really most important <laughs> hardcore components to answer that from question. You, so, we learned from you. Oh, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I would say the thin little sliver, maybe what we could add to that answer um, is um, this issue of this idea of being a magnet. And so uh, bringing clinical folks too. So, um, while progress hopefully is being made in, in the discovery and the research and the development of therapies, we still want to take care of patients as best as we possibly can with the resources that are available to us from a medical care, medical uh, psychosocial perspective. And so having a foundation like this also allows you to serve as a, a central hub, if you will, to engage with clinicians and to um, help them help patients in your community live their best life. Mm -hmm. But I love what Colleen and Jessica said, they're spot on. Great, great. Well, I um, want to, once again, I want to thank you, our speakers for sharing your expertise and all of your experiences with us today. 
Um, I'd also like to say a word of thanks to the supporters from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, DAF, which is an advised fund of Sil Silicon Valley Community Foundation. And a special thanks to each one of you in the audience for joining us. Um, after this webinar there, you'll receive a short survey and we'd be really appreciative if you complete it, it helps us develop future webinars. So everybody enjoy your evening and thank you again for joining.